Hello, everyone. My name is Frida Afari. I am an Iranian American librarian and translator in Los Angeles and author of the forthcoming book, Socialist Feminism, A New Approach. On behalf of Internationalism from Below, Haymarket Books, Commons Journal, and New Politics Journal, I would like to welcome you to today's panel on how feminist solidarity can help Ukraine. Since Russia's full-scale imperialist invasion of Ukraine was launched by Vladimir Putin on February 24th, Putin's speeches, Russian state propaganda, and the actual massacres and rapes committed by the Russian army have revealed the genocidal and misogynist character of this invasion. At the same time, the resistance of the Ukrainian people has been heroic. There have been many other expressions of opposition to this war as well, ranging from global protests to humanitarian aid, convoys, and initiatives by individuals and groups to help the resistance in Ukraine. Ukrainian feminists have been an active part of the resistance, both in actual combat and in various other invaluable capacities, such as healthcare, childcare, food production, communications and strategizing through social media as writers, leaders, and spokeswomen. Among the more than 5 million Ukrainian refugees in Europe who are mostly women and children, many women are promoting valuable communication with the world. The Russian feminist anti-war resistance, though much smaller in comparison, has brought together 40 different feminist groups inside Russia to oppose the invasion. They have also attempted to fight state disinformation by publicizing facts about the war through a telegram channel. However, many of their members, along with other opponents of the war within Russia, have been arrested and silenced by the Russian police state and its campaign of disinformation. Desperately needed is a coordinated global feminist solidarity effort to support the Ukrainian popular resistance and their struggle to maintain their country's independence and democratic rights. Today's panel will argue that solidarity with Ukraine is critical for the present and future of women's rights, anti-racism, labor rights, environmentalism, LGBTQ rights, and the right to truth and social justice seeking. The Ukrainian struggle is a determinant for the future of humanity. Our speakers are the following. Yulia Yurchenko is the author of Ukraine and the Empire of Capital, From Marketization to Armed Conflict, published by Pluto Press in 2018. She is a senior lecturer in political economy at the Political Economy Governance, Finance and Accountability Institute at the University of Greenwich, UK. She's also vice chair of the Critical Political Economy Research Network. Oksana Dutchak is a Ukrainian sociologist and co-editor of the journal Commons. She is the Deputy Director of the Center for Social and Labor Research in Kyiv, where she has studied a work and working conditions as well as gender inequalities. She's now a refugee. Sasha Tolliver is a PhD candidate in gender studies at the Central European University in Vienna. And currently she is a fellow at the Leibniz Center for Contemporary History in Potsdam. Sasha explores the role of the state-supported women's organization in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Women's Anti-Fascist Committee in Soviet policymaking. Her previous research project was on the underground women's movement in Soviet Leningrad. Sasha has co-edited the book Feminist Samizdat 40 years after by, published by Commonplace Books in Moscow in 2020. Wanda Powell is a professor emerita of history at the Los Angeles Southwest College. 
She continues her work in ethnic studies. Uh, uh, we will start the panel with a one hour long period of conversation with Yulia, Oksana, Sasha and Wanda. Then we will move to questions from the audience for 30 minutes. I urge you to put your questions in the chart after you have had a chance to hear most of the conversation because some, maybe some of your questions will be answered by the conversation. And then you will be able to respond to the whole of the conversation instead of only part of it. So uh, now I will start with the questions for the panelists. Question uh, number one is, why is the Ukrainian struggle a determinant for the future of humanity? Yeah, here I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, the first question is probably the most important to set our agenda today because this idea of feminist solidarity is a long-term as well as a daily uh, intellectual challenge for women all around the world. To date, uh, we have approximately 60 million refugees around the world. If you watch the documentary of the great sculptor activist from China, Ai Weiwei, it is showing you that now to that 60 million, we're adding 5.8 million Ukrainians. And the world right now has open arms. But the causes of this displacement, the causes of this refugee crisis is due to wars, civil wars, religious wars, economic wars. We've got plagues, SARS, Ebola, HIV, COVID. We've got climate change. We've got modern slavery under the pseudonym of mass incarceration. I was talking to my son and I was remembering a Marvin Gaye song out of the 60s in the civil rights movement. And the question of the song is, What's going on? And that's a question that women and men all over the world have to ask in this very tumultuous time. What's really going on? But then my son came back to say a song that he loved in the 90s was an Irish song by a group called the Cranberries uh, that was called Zombie. And I was like, wow. So I started listening to the song and the words just floored me because it dealt with children who had found a bomb which had been set off with traffic in the marketplace. And the lyrics, I won't sing because my Irish accent is not that good, but I wanted you to understand that the song, the lyrics goes, another mother's breaking heart is taking over when the violence causes silence. We must be mistaken. It's the same old theme since 1916. In your head, in your head, they're still fighting with their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns. In your head, in your head, they are dying. What's in your head, zombie? Now think, who is that zombie? Who is facing and challenging the world to the possibility of World War III? Zombie, okay? And these songs mm -hmm. represent and symbolic of what most of us are feeling and going through. I have listened when the, um, the Pussy Riots came to UCLA. I went to listen to them. And I have watched documentaries on the Doc Daughters of Ukraine singing Rosie. We are all in this together. And the feminine solidarity is so important. It's important for all thinking persons to revisit the history and what has led us to this crisis in Ukraine. And we have to know it's not just about a war over sovereignty. 
but a major battle that is possibly tipping the scales against another genocide. We in America are very, very familiar, starting with the indigenous people in the United States. So that American Holocaust, where over a hundred million people were lost, the, the, in Africa, 60 million. We do not want to go to those deadly times again, but we have to fight back. We have to show that self-determination and self-governance. I, I'm sorry this is a little long, but I, I wanted to make sure that you understand that we are fighting in order to make sure that people go beyond the crisis just in Ukraine. Because what happens in Ukraine is going to affect all of us. It's already affecting all of us. The authoritarians would very much like to drive us in like cattle into a pen of self-destruction or like lemurs just flying off a, a, a mountainside into self-mutilation. It can no longer be perceived as a normalized step in the history of humanity. But this, this is a deliberate effort by oligarchic governments or parties bent on the destruction of the other to gain power over the majority. The goal is to pass, and, and they want to, whether uh, Bolsonaro or whether we're talking Trump or whatever, they want to be greater than Augustus, Caesar Augustus. They want to be more powerful than Papa Doc Duvalier of Haiti or the Shah of Iran or Castro of Cuba more. And Putin wants to strive to be beyond Stalin, Lenin, Gorbachev, and his mentor Yeltsin. The totalitarian leaders today want to reign beyond their lifetime. And as we see in the Philippines right now, Marcos is actually has his son running with Duarte's daughter. We have to be on our best abilities of activism that we can ever think of. This is not politics as usual, but the use of the advanced technology, improved propaganda, tried and tested terrorism. What is unusual is the rapidity and the magnitude of these overthrows around the world and the fragility of even the old pseudo-democracies to withstand their own interior dismantling that forestalls a robust but vulnerable democracy like Ukraine, which it is facing now. Invasion by Russia in increments had been seen. It, it had even been anticipated. We, we, we knew they were going and possibly doing something in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine. But the actual challenge, the initiation of World War III, maybe a few uh, diehard military people thought of it. But the threat of nuclear holocaust, after everything we've learned as a world, as a, a, a global citizen of World War II, of, after Chernobyl, after Fukushima disaster in Japan, this was not foreseen or anticipated. How is the Ukrainian crisis a determinant of the future of humanity? When the death and displacement of millions of ordinary civilians, human beings, is treated as collateral damage in a battle to gain absolute control by any means, Ukraine is the canary in the gold mine. Can I go further, Frida? Please, Oksana. Yes, thank you, Frida, for inviting. Thank you, Wanda, very much for this very passionate speech, which I really uh, feel close to what I feel. Mm, I will also continue with the discussion about uh, whether the Ukrainian struggle is a determinant for the future of humanity. And here, 
maybe I would be not that optimistic um, and put some reflections how I see it. Uh, we can say basically that the war in Ukraine, it's um, like another, yet another war which regularly happens in the modern world. Um, or we can say it's uh, another war in the line of post-socialist conflicts in countries which undergo post-socialist transformation in the region. But of course, um, it is also distinctive in many ways from what we, we, what we observed in the region and um, from the wars we observed in uh, recent history of uh, the world. Um, but I cannot call it a uh, determinant war for, for, for various reasons, among which is a kind of very maybe a childish and uh, personal reason. It is really hard to imagine that your country and your life is a determinant for the future of humanity. But there are also, of course, very important uh, outcomes or conclusions which can be made out of this situation and this war and I think which are determinant for the future of humanity. So um, first to say it's like as any war this war has uh, many dimensions which are pe personal, collective, regional, global. Um, it has political and economic dimensions and has a dimension of social reproduction, which is uh, in Ukraine under, uh, going under the catastrophic conditions now um, because it's endangered by military aggression, like as existentially human life is endangered, but it also endangered um, by the economic outcomes of the, of the war and collapse of the economic production. On, in which um, uh, social reproduction in capitalist society is rooted. Uh, and it has also a global dimension uh, of social reproduction because it triggers fuel prices due to sanctions and it triggers food prices due to the fact that Ukraine was one of the biggest uh, agrarian export, uh, exporter in the world. And here is one important and I think decisive um, observation which can be drawn upon the situation is the priorities of global capitalist and political class. It is uh, obvious in the situation of sanction-related discussion. So we see that uh, while sanctions to stop Putin, they, are, they require a certain increase in European in prices of uh, European costs of European social reproduction, um, but uh, also the continuation of war. Uh, it will uh, trigger the costs of social reproduction of many poorer countries, which depends uh, on Ukrainian export of grain. Uh, and uh, so we see the priorities, while the sanctions are still um, like critically debated by the global capitalist and political class, uh, especially the um, topic of um, embargo on export of gas and, um, and um, oil. Um, so we see how these debates are unfolding and um, this also poses the question to which extent the Western countries are really ready for the any version of the Green New Deal, any version of just transition. Uh, because uh, we see how in this situation uh, the societies and the Western political class is not ready to give up on its total dependence on fuel uh, and fossil fuel. And uh, it also, on the other hand, may be a good opportunity to debate uh, this and to, to turn around or to rethink this whole discussion about the environmental future of humanity. Uh, and also um, another, which is important also for me very much, uh, is um, that this uh, situation has a um, decisive political implications. And uh, these implications, they are the most painful part of experience for the Ukrainian left and for Ukrainian feminists and for Ukrainian left feminists at me. So at some point we understood that the solidarity issue, so which is very central to the political struggle of leftists and feminists, uh, it is not as it seems to be before. Uh, we see and hear all the kind of weird statements and conclusions um, 
for example, feminists doing victim blaming and pacifism, which denies the agency and rights to self-defense and self-determination. And leftists against militarization, also meaning in this case, demilitarization of the victim in the face of ruthless aggression. And uh, why for left, it is easy to, to do this kind of shift because they can easily go to the geopolitical level when every, and repeat all this old mantra about uh, the main threat of Western capitalism, not seeing the reality on the ground. For feminism, it is like where the basic assumption is empirical life and um, the relations and um, protection of the weaker. Um, uh, it is... Um, even more surprising. I know it's complicated and I know that it's not uneven. I know that we, Ukraine and Ukrainian society is a very inconvenient victim for global left because we have been unlucky enough to be attacked not by still hegemonic Western country. Uh, but um, I know that um, all, of course, I know that uh, not all the left and feminist movement is like that. And this event and many other events uh, is very, makes this um, difference very visible. Uh, but here is another important observation which can be determinant for the future of humanity. It appears that left and feminists left, um, for whom the solidarity is so decisive in their struggle, um, fail to practice solidarity in such a critical moments. And it puts the question of whether the possibility of better future for humanity, of common struggle for this better future is possible. Uh, my personal, and that's probably the last thing I would say now, my personal conclusion here, uh, that after my own and probably Ukrainian feminist movement mistake of being concentrated so much on the Western theories and Western experiences. We are not uh, like not guilty. We are still we are also guilty of West centrism and uh, Eurocentrism. Um, and there are also, of course, materialist reasons for that, because when the resources are concentrated in one place, it's that place which um, spread its ideology and its networking the best. And But now I feel that, uh, and this is a probably conclusive, like my, one of the most important conclusion to myself, that uh, we as Ukrainian uh, leftists and feminists should pay better attention to the non-Western and us, uh, and provisionally, let's call it like intersectional parts of political feminist and left movement. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oksana. Really appreciate that. Uh, Yulia, would like to answer? Um, yes, thank you very much uh, for organizing this important event. And it's it's uh, it's really humbling to be part of such a stellar panel in this uh, extremely difficult time. One of the things that I think is important for us globally to learn from uh, this uh, crisis, the Russo-Ukrainian war, is that what we are seeing is the crisis of solidarity and the so-called international order. Uh, and we, we saw that through the developing of the events uh, since February, and we still see it. Uh, and it is a test uh, of this, uh, we see the test of international solidarity and also a precedent to either follow or abandon or perhaps a mix of both. When Putin feels entitled to Ukraine, when Germany tells Ukrainian ambassador that there is no point in helping Ukraine on the day it is invaded, um, we see that what we read in that is that some people are more disposable internationally than other, not least those who will be affected by the disruption of the food supplies right now in North Africa, not only because they too are being seen as somebody who doesn't matter as much as somebody else. Of course, this is nothing new in international politics, but this is something that I'm sure everybody in this panel and those millions uh, of people who have been displaced and suffering for generations are so tired of. We see a crisis of international legal order. We see that incremental taking away of borders is somehow being normalized. We see that international security order enshrined in the United Nations organizations is not up to 
functioning and indeed it was so by design it was built hierarchical by the victors of the second world war to uh so that they have more of a say in how the international security is going to function later so it was faulty by design and we need to be rethinking internationally uh, how to make sure that the world indeed is a secure place for everyone, no matter what country you're coming from, what their GDP is, and whether that country has been a colony or not before. Because we do not have that. All the cracks in the international security order are showing themselves open right now. And there is, of course, also a threat of further militarization and further uh, encroachment of global authoritarianism that we should be fighting tooth and nail on every level in every country. Yet when we think about the ways of building solidarity, which I think is the only way to tackle this machine that is in, encroaching on the livelihoods, lives and, uh, and our planet everywhere, we need to think of what we, of what we mean by solidarity, because we hear a lot of calls to that. Uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean the same to everyone. And we need to we need to expand what that word means uh to us if we try if we're trying to actually build that solidarity to me it means seeing the issue at hand which is the russo-ukrainian war and the food crisis and the aids crisis and the access to medication and vaccination that uh was uh so eloquently described just before me um uh in this event what we need to be talking about is we, we first we need to see these issues uh, via a decolonial, anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, anti-capitalist lens, and then act accordingly. We see all those components of social, ecological, and environmental destruction right now, like in so many other wars, military, class, gender, and class wars, and we must stop them all once and for all. A lot of a lot of this uh, is due uh, a lot of these problems that we see internationally are due to the mainstream analytical frames that inform political choices of the world leaders and their ideological indoctrination into perpetuating the machine of the empire of capital, making sure it's on life support and kicking and alive for the rest of our days. And we must tackle that. In feminism too. There is no unified and dogmatic feminist doctrine, uh, and that and that is not a problem in itself. It's good to have a diversity of voices, and indeed, uh, feminist movements in different countries face a set of different problems. Some are similar, some are quite different. And different ways of feminist thought brought us some different iterations of where our struggle should be focused on, while some principles remain vital. We need to be centering care, safeguarding, support for women and those most vulnerable, fighting patriarchy and its dangerous gender norms, generous for everyone, dangerous for everyone. Implementation scenarios for those are not always the most unified again, and that presents challenges for Ukrainians affected by the war uh, with wider implications for women and not only. It is popular these days to talk about intersectional feminism, yet what I often gather is that not only class is structurally missing from that intersectionality or at least obscured in those analyses, but the decolonial and racial politics of them are still very quiet, even if present, are steeped in the reflections of North European colonialisms and their own cultural and racialized schemes of subjugation. For Soviet space, what we have would have been very clear now in the analysis and the interviews and the petitions that we have floating around uh, is kind of still largely a terra incognita uh, for analysts, for correspondents, for scholars outside the uh, what's what's called post-Soviet space, and that also must change. We need to be learning our post-feminists uh, from post-Soviet uh, countries, uh, from feminists elsewhere in the world and that that learning should be mutual we should be learning more about each other's struggles so we can build meaningful solidarity built on the voices of each other and on the needs of each other and of course the criticism of capitalism should take center stage globally even ipcc reports now make appeal to that and i think centering the the capitalist system with all of its awful expressions and milita militarized including and ecocidal is something that unifies all of us regardless of where we are internationally and the russo ukrainian war is bringing into the limelight of the press uh, and the political discourse many of those issues of racialized patriarchal militarized capitalism and we collectively must use this attention to talk of all such wars and crisis and displacement and ecocide 
side and understand that the source of those is the same and that we must fight it together in all locations once and for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yulia. Sasha, are you muted? Uh, I mean, I can, <laughs> I can maybe contribute to this question uh, briefly, but I guess my main part will be the second question. But I just want to um, kind of also remind from a perspective of a feminist from Russia about what Russian state is and what Ukrainians are fighting against now and for for what, right? Because uh, First of all, and it's uh, I think is not discussed very often on um, uh, during discussions about the current war is that Russia itself is turning into a clearly fascist state. But what is more important is that Russian oligarchs uh, have been funding alt-right, anti-gender, anti-LGBTQ organizations all over the world for many, many years. And many of the traditional values and anti-gender, anti-LGBTQ, anti-abortion movements all over the world are actually funded by Russian state or uh, uh, oligarchs who are affiliated with the Russian state. And therefore, I think that uh, it adds additional dimension. So it's kind of fighting against Russian imperialism now. It's also um, fighting against this strong transnational anti-gender movement as well. Thank you. Really appreciate that addition. So with that great introduction, let's go to the next question. What is the current state of the Russian feminist anti-war resistance? What are the connections between them and Ukrainian women? Yeah, thank you a lot for the question. And um, yeah, so I will talk on behalf of this feminist anti-war resistance as I am a member of this movement. Uh, but I will talk only very briefly about what we are actually doing and what it represents. And I would be happy to address this uh, question further in Q&A session if someone is interested. But I would prefer also to focus more on what kind of function Russian anti-war movement plays in the Western discourse regarding Ukrainian war against Ukraine. Uh, so briefly about our movement, our movement was founded on the second day of this new wave of Russian aggression in Ukraine on 25th of February with a manifest that was uh, published and then translated into dozens of languages. And currently our movement is um, uh, structured like a very wide network of loosely connected affinity groups which are coordinated via our telegram channel and via our telegram bot so activists from all over the world and uh, mostly from russia uh, can send us their ideas suggestions reports experiences and uh, through this um, feedback we kind of formulate our next actions steps circulate some ideas etc and currently there are we are small movement in comparison of the size of Russia. We have only 30,000 subscribers in our Telegram channel and thousands of activists in Russia. And our actions normally cover uh, from 20 to 100 uh, cities and villages in Russia. It depends on different actions. For example, uh, for the day, uh, for the uh, so-called Victory Day in Russia, we tried to sabotage this militaristic uh, celebration in Russia with uh, recalling the actions which is called Women in Black, when Women in Black, uh, Women in Black stand on the crowded uh, in the crowded city spaces in silence to attract attention to actually disaster that the war brings. Uh, but um, yeah, so we do, and we also working with trade unions. We are making small steps to organizing a uh, political women's strike. We have a strike fund which supports people who are fired because of their anti-war position, etc. And uh, it was kind of easy to for feminists in Russia to get mobilized against the war because we see this war as a um, extreme culmination uh, of 
patriarchal violence that we've been living through. But of course, the scale of this violence is incomprehensible for us as people from Russia. We cannot even imagine what Ukrainian people are going through now. But it's uh, for feminists, it's easier to probably switch to anti-war activism precisely because we've been fighting this patriarchal violence for so many years in Russia. And of course, you can see certain connections uh, between um, between uh, patriarchal violence in Russia before uh, the new stage of this war, decriminalization of domestic violence, overtly sexist rhetorics of Putin, etc. And uh, there is no um, kind of surprise in uh, um, the extent to which it unfolded. And uh, that is disastrous. But uh, um, and we can see that, for example, now among uh, criminal, um, there are criminal rates among women in Russia grew dramatically. About 23% of new criminal cases are against women. And this is connected, of course, with new laws uh, that uh, give criminal charges for fakes about Russian uh, army or for any type of anti-war activity. And uh, yeah, so that's um, that's the kind of overview of our movement. And uh, what is important for us as feminists from Russia fighting against Russian aggression is Ukraine, in Ukraine is to also uh, position ourselves as allies in this struggle, as allies of Ukrainian people. And that's why for us, actually, when we only launched our manifesto, was not even possible to comprehend uh, how our position within discussions about what kind of support Ukraine needs now will uh, play. So as anti-war peaceful resistance from Russia, we got lots of public attention. Uh, we got numerous invitations to different uh, round tables, um, give interviews, etc. Uh, and we are very grateful for this attention and we are very pleased. It's a huge support. But at some point we realized that we actually uh, kind of more used than hurt, I would say, in that regard. And we uh, represent kind of pacifist feminist position, which we are not. And this is very important that uh, for us, there is, uh, it is clear as day that there is no uh, very bright perspective for peaceful resistance in Russia to end this war, right? And uh, we, as allies, we totally support uh, not all of us, uh, not, I cannot say that everyone, because we didn't have assembly on this issue, but I can say for sure that most of us whom I know uh, do support, uh, for, uh, for example, military aid to Ukraine, um, as well as sanctions, because we cannot see ourselves as feminists uh, arguing with this demands that are, as Oksana mentioned, deriving from lived experience of people in Ukraine. Um, but uh, as a pacifist movement from, pacifist, uh, anti-war movement from Russia, uh, we, uh, we were not supposed to advocate this position, of course. And that's why partly we got so much attention probably. Uh, and we think that, uh, and we had recently an anecdotal case with our uh, with another manifesto published under our name and the manifest was against uh, military aid to Ukraine and when we get into conflict with this uh, US based magazine US based right uh, and ask them to change the name of the organization that published this manifest instead of accepting their mistake and saying sorry and correcting themselves they suggested us to do our research first and when we encounter, uh, <laughs> encounter such a hostile approach, uh, it just reminded us of what, again, Aksana and Yulia addressed a lot, how this knowledge production is structured and who is allowed to become a source of certain knowledge and who is allowed to become just data for this theory and knowledge production. Um, that was really striking example of limitations of current solidarity and acceptance of others as uh, equal subjects that you should account um, now for and for us, it's very important as again feminists from Russia, um, though I'm not in Russia now. Uh, it's really important to emphasize that solidarity uh, in our regard means not only demands and claims, but it also means readiness to for uh, to at least share a bit the plight 
of those who are suffering. And uh, of course, we cannot even imagine what Ukrainian people are going through. Uh, but it is important to give away some level of your security and safety, um, maybe to challenge your own principles to be able to support those who are suffering. And uh, yeah, here I will end. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, Sasha, would you like to say the name of that journal who rejected your uh, request to, to uh, correct their mistake? Uh, they actually corrected it today, as we learned, without notifying us. Oh, okay. uh, so I might not even uh, mention oh, that the journal fine. itself. That's but, fine. Uh, that's fine. So I have uh, Wanda and Yulia, their hands raised. Would you, would you like to say something in response? I just wanted to bring a brief description. If uh, any of our audience has not read uh, Svetlana Alexevich, uh, let me hold it up a little higher, The uh, Unwomanly Face of War, where actual women oral history, once they're across the kitchen table and basically became very familiar with her, they began to tell the truth of their experiences in war how they were experienced as women. And this day, on, in terms of the victory celebration, w one woman talks about she gathered all of her laundry because on that day, she was only going to be occupied with the cleansing, with the, the spirit, because the war was so devastating. And it was the day where she would just cry while she was doing her laundry. And the, the idea of both capitalism and the the copycatting of authoritarian totalitarian governments and when you talk about communication and Oksana talks about this uh, idea that they are learning from each other they are in solidarity they are learning from each other and so when something works they basically go to that position of trying it out in that particular situation. We're seeing that all over, whether we're in Brazil, whether we're in Harlem, uh, we're seeing that we, we, we see so much of it. So it's important for women to experience, as uh, Sasha talks about, the experience of other women in the situation so that we're listening very, very carefully to all the women who are experiencing war, but especially so that we can be not only compassionate, but activists in this crisis with Ukraine. Thank you so much, Anna. And Yulia? Um, yes, thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you, Wanda. Um, it's, uh, I, I would like to add to what you were saying about how important it is if we're trying to help to listen to those needing help, what kind of help they actually need and to support them in that, not to project our own understanding of what they might need, because that in itself is very problematic. And the statement that uh, Sasha is referring to that involved her organization uh, that was published um, uh, that was published uh, online. I'm not sure if there was also a paper version of it. Um, and um, some recent interviews of world-known feminists have indicated that uh, while they have their own epistemological, ontological stance, their moral stance and vision of how things should be, they, you, as well-meaning as they may have been, haven't included that voice of Ukrainian feminists. And actually, Sasha's organization of the anti-war uh, group of feminists in Russia are showing what that solidarity actually might look like, where you support your Ukrainian sisters in what they say they need. So there was, uh, there was a recent interview with Judith Butler just last week, and there was the statement that included so that, that, that these sort of like there were big names like Nancy Fraser and Titi Bhattacharya and Cynthia Arusia and Silvia Federici, who I, I, I was quite surprised to see proposing uh, that it, it was beautiful statements for a peaceful solution, but there was no plan of how to arrive at that peaceful solution. Because while we can appeal to 
um, to a peace be in a state where everybody puts down the arms. We need to have a plan of how to get there. So there are those idealist abstract visions of solidarity that are being developed that to my mind and surprise are quite undialectic. They are visions that appeal uh, to and talk of the world and women's realities as the help I would like them to be without a reference of how they are and how to get to that ideal. And there is no plan, no practicable or otherwise solution. There is no reflection of the challenges faced by women in the conflict zone or men for that matter, uh, or what is needed to scaffold and meet the needs of those who are suffering. Contrasting to those are the materially informed approaches that channel theory into praxis, as theory is practice informed. It has to be. The task for feminism and feminist solidarity is to do what is necessary to help the victim of aggression to protect themselves by any means necessary as the context of said aggression in Ukraine presently is beyond any imaginable and imagination horrific. And that means arming Ukraine and overcoming own personal moral, moral conflicts about violence as it is not about us staying pious, but it is about helping those who are subject to violence and they need to protect themselves. So standing by and non-interference in such situations are tantamount to condoning the continuation of violence. And indeed, the war will only be over when the arms are put down, yet the aggressor has no intention of putting down those arms. And there is also no moral nor military strength equivalence between the parties in this war. And so the moral choice here for me is clear. I'm also against war. I hate violence of any form. Yet when somebody comes to you with a gun, you waving uh, a flower in their face is not going to solve the problem. And there lies the contradiction that in practice is more difficult to resolve sometimes. Actually, it's sometimes probably easier to resolve than it is in theorizations. But when our theorizations are not helping resolve the practical situation, then what good, what good are they? That's from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's that's. Uh very powerful response to the recent statements. And uh, unless there are any other comments, I would like to go to the next question. So the next question is um, following through on what, what you may have just ended with, which is uh, what are some immediate ways in which feminists around the world can help the Ukrainian resistance and Ukrainian refugees? I can start probably Please. at this point. Please, okay. I want to, uh, I mean, I don't see um, what I can say a lot here because like the demands are uh, relatively clear. Like with the um, refugee situation, we see how the bordering country are um, doing it kind of the best way they have been doing in many years with people from all over the world like um, running from the war we see how almost a model um, a reply now but of course there are it is not without a problems and uh, for example there were all these problems with uh, people of color like uh, with roma citizens and uh, uh, students from african countries uh, or others who were trying to flee across the border and they had problems with, with border guards and they later had some problems in settling and so on. But of course, um, there is also all this um, problems arising from emergency escape from the war, <coughs> which produced additional vulnerability, which um, became obvious in the situation of the high risk of sex trafficking, of human trafficking and all that. And these are problems, I think, where the border, feminists from the bordering countries and also from Ukraine are doing quite a lot because uh, as uh, I saw like many pictures, uh, they are just spreading the lef leaflets on the uh, any point where the concentration of Ukrainian women fleeing the war is big, like in bordering uh, train stations of Poland and so on, like uh, trying to provide information and all the possible support. Uh, but there is also like the whole discussion behind, which is 
um, that in many European countries themselves are um, kind of victims of neoliberal austerity processes for many years. And these processes have diminished uh, the, and the feminists, local feminists, of course, were protesting against these processes for years, especially left feminists. But these processes left the landscape of all that infrastructure which is needed for women, um, and it's mostly women and often with children who are fleeing the country. Um, all that infrastructure is a bit, uh, I would say, devastated in many places, and uh, there are not enough places in uh, care facilities, in schools, kindergartens, hospitals, and so on. So this um, territory, uh, which have been under contest from feminists for many years, the way they're trying to, to do their battle with uh, neoliberal austerity, is now uh, may become the even more visible and uh, yeah, like uh, affecting uh, the situation of even more women, including those new, newly arrived and those who have been there for quite a while. Uh, so I think it is also important to continue this um, this thing, uh, this uh, struggle, or this protest, or this political discussion. And uh, it actually has uh, quite a good uniting potential because uh, this is a situation which uh, is common and known to, to feminists, at least left feminists, in uh, all over the countries. Uh, in Europe and far beyond Europe, in uh, in many Eastern countries and in many countries in uh, on other continents. Uh, but I also think uh, again, and we're here is another thing which is extremely important. Is the um, yeah that um, what Sasha was already voicing and Julia was also uh, talking about that that uh, we kind of expect that um, the um, idea of the any war as a patriarchal bad and anything will not delusion uh, many people on the feminist side into rejecting the um, right to self-defense which the Ukraine and Ukrainian people and Ukrainian society have. Uh, for me, this situation is, um, and uh, going a bit back to what Yulia was saying and uh, um, building upon it, like when uh, we see all that um, prominent figure of Western, mostly, but not only feminism, um, the, relying on quite idealistic perception of, uh, of the situation on the ground. And it puts the question of uh, how the living experiences of people um, are perceived, communicated and uh, accepted by um, people who don't have that living experience. Because it's obvious that for many, uh, in many cases, uh, those uh, feminists or leftists who uh, who keep this um, perception of uh, that the war should be just stopped, uh, they are usually, but not exclusively, but usually coming from countries who uh, have not been under threat of war for uh, decades. Uh, at least. And this put the question of materialist reality and analysis very sharply. And I cannot say that uh, for me, um, for me personally, there is also a very painful uh, story behind these reflections of uh, what is uh, allowed and what is not allowed and which way the society in terms of army, military, uh, defense and everything should be developed. Because I myself for years was a part of uh, anti-militaristic feminist um, groups in Ukraine. And uh, in the beginning of this year, on, in February, I found myself to be relying on the things which I have been criticized for years, like the military development of the country. And uh, yeah, I think there are, I still don't come up with the answer to myself, but uh, unlike many people who changed their perception of the situation in Ukraine uh, overnight, uh, I do feel guilty. and. Uh, Unfortunately, not many people feel that, but I think that's uh, that's not a very pleasant feeling, of course, and that's probably not a very constructive feeling, but it, that's a feeling which uh, at least um, allows people to say, yes, we were wrong. And try, from that point, you can start to analyze why you were wrong and trying to understand how to make the things to be right. Sorry, that's also a bit of kind of personal experience, but I think it's also important to voice it. Thank you. Yes, indeed, it is very important, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, Yulia, would you like to answer the question as well? 
Yes, I would like to um, add a couple of things about immediate help for refugees, because there are, um, as Oksana highlighted, there are uh, a lot of schemes in place and there are a lot of because refugee problem is not a new problem, unfortunately, internationally, there are a lot of issues and uh, aspects of this phenomenon that um, are quite known as to what to do. But there are some issues that I think sometimes uh, do not hit the people. And I would like that, would like to raise that. So, for example, um, there is a strong gender dimension to this uh, refugee movement from Ukraine, not least as in specifically because uh, men of conscription age between 18 uh, and 60 are not allowed to leave the country unless they, are, they have health problems or they, they are fathers of three and more children. And even then some face problems. So we have an influx of uh, uh, of uh, minors and minors, elders and women uh, into predominantly uh, EU countries. And with that, uh, we have, uh, Oksana again already appealed to that, there, there have been a lot of reports uh, of people, uh, specifically women uh, going, young women going missing. Uh, and uh, there, there, uh, there, uh, uh, there is already evidence of them kind of falling into the hands of traffickers. And there is this uncomfortable problem in the European Union that divides a lot uh, of people in the political discourse. Uh, that is a problem of liberal, liberalization of prostitution in a number of EU countries. And because that uh, the kind of that freedom of sex trade, if you like, exists in a number of countries, it will be impossible for the trafficked persons to seek appropriate and proportional justice for the traffickers or pimps, um, uh, because uh, what we what we the problem that we have here is not a is not a simple uh, is not some sort of simple uh, sex workers uh, problem, which is of course never simple. But we have people who are under duress, uh, who are subject to duress and abuse and exploitation, uh, and uh, those problems in countries where prostitution is liberalized, or, or sex trade is liberalized, whichever term you prefer. Uh, those problems of duress, abuse and exploitation are much more difficult to prove to courts and bring those abusers to account. And uh, considering the circumstances, we cannot be talking of free choice to partake, partake in sex trade by these predominantly women, but uh, there, there must be some men as well. So many women, girls and boys will simply disappear through the cracks of the system that does not work for safeguarding the vulnerable from exploitation. Sometimes, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So there must be initiatives built to track and protect to track and protect those uh, who need uh, who need help and uh, and who are in the state of vulnerability. Um, so they that that is something that feminist groups and not only feminist groups, uh, various uh, groups who are interested in helping uh, can be working on right now uh, in the UK already uh, because of how poorly uh, safeguarded and pl and uh, planned that kind of system of matching those who are seeking asylum with their potential host was working. There is an investigation. Uh, into that into that scheme, but Ukraine is quite a unique case. I'm aware of that. So some of the tasks for feminist feminist solidarity locally will be work with refugee handling groups, see what needs they have, uh, try to help them out with housing uh, capacity, building for networks, fundraising, uh, lobby your governments to you know to make it easier for for people to to settle in. And this doesn't re doesn't refer only to Ukrainian refugees, of course, because Ukrainians are just the and and citizens citizens of other countries who have been in Ukraine at the time, which is the most recent wave. But of course, there are multiple groups of refugees from all sorts of different countries in the EU right now, but also internationally in the United States, there are there are their own groups in Canada, there are their own groups. So uh, every every uh, every group who's looking to help refugees right now should be identifying the groups uh, and the countries from which those uh, refugees are coming, looking at how they can help them in conventional uh, ways, but also looking at what specific needs those groups have. Um, and uh, also communicating with each other uh, so that um, 
you know, so that fit, so that larger phenomena that define uh, and govern, uh, regulate rather movement of people across borders uh, are tackled not just immediately, but in the long run. So, for example, criminalization of the border crossing that we are having now in the UK and in the US as well. There has been a lot of problems with that. So those are some of the more some of the more immediate things that I wanted to raise. I have kind of more long term ideas of how to uh, build. Uh, build back the spaces from which people were forced to leave, but I'll perhaps leave that till later. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And in terms of the, uh, people who want to send help to women inside Ukraine, because um, still there are, you know, uh, okay, so of the five, over five million refugees, most of them are women and children, but so many decided to stay in the country and are fighting in various ways. So what are some ways in which that help can be given? Um, is this a question to me? That there is a number of different international organizations and local organizations, and uh, I'm happy to uh, stick stick some links uh, later to the, to the mailing list. Uh, about them, uh, the organization that I'm part of, uh, Sozialny Ruch, we're uh, helping um, with uh, internally displaced people and, and their needs, and indeed uh, it is quite a serious problem. So there are organizations that help with provision of medication, with basic sanitary goods, food, uh, and clothes, and very often actually what those organizations, what the organizations that are helping the, uh, the internally displaced people are asking is not uh, not so much even money, even though money is important, but dried foods, dried food clothes, uh, personal hygiene products, because in a lot of areas, especially uh, in the temporarily occupied, most recently occupied areas or areas near the fight, near where the fighting is happening, the supply lines are interrupted. So even if you have the money, there isn't supplies in the shops. So then there are humanitarian convoys being organized. So what I would say that depending on where you are, because I'm not, I suspect, suspect there is an international audience here, find your local group that deals with collection of humanitarian aid. If you don't have one, get together with your neighbors and set one up. Uh, and uh, identify a group that will help you logistically with moving those things across the border. There is quite a wide network of them. And again, I'm happy to populate a, a list of the usual suspects that people could be using. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And Wanda, please go ahead. I was just uh, a couple of points. One in, in terms of actions that are needed. We have a large Ukrainian population in near Glendale and the Ukrainian church here. So those are uh, organizations that you can reach out to. But I think there's something very, very important in discussing whether you have refugees from Somalia or from Cameroon uh, the experiences of not only being homeless, but in some cases coming to be stateless. Uh, as basically Yulia pointed out, in the United States now, they are practicing what is also being practiced in Greece and what is being practiced in Belarus. There are a pushback. And so they are scapegoating around the own their own laws within each of those countries. So the United States is pursuing and allowing people not to get to the place where they can actually file for asylum. And we bring this out in terms of understanding because border patrols can be very brutal and harsh. And so in the situation uh, when people are leaving, let's say, Turkey, and they wind up on uh, the island of Lesbos. They are being driven back into Turkish waters. They're being driven back. So they never get to help or to groups to help. And I think we need to be aware overall. This response is heartwarming as uh, uh, Asana uh, talked about the response of ordinary people who their hearts are feeling out, but you have to watch for a pushback. 
because it's being racialized within the United States. And many people from, uh, we still haven't found children from Katrina and the climate change. We still are looking in terms of uh, Somalian refugees that are here and going through their experience from the UK and before they arrive. Uh, it's important for us to look at that long term so that we go not only for the aid that we can give now, but the education and the solidarity needed to understand when the tide changes. There is going to be a point, especially in immigration of the United States. They want to look good now, but it's not a system because they have not resolved it for over 11 million immigrants from Latin America in the United States now. So I think it's very important that in that action plan that we are looking not only immediate, but especially in the United States there. And also be careful, we are asking, and, and one of the things that it is important, where are the weapons coming from? The question I always ask, how many ordinary women and children have to be displaced or die before those of power who know what weapons and military action is needed before they're forced to act? And the, the actual distractions, right now we're dealing with Roe versus Wade, these are distractions so that the empathy and the actions that are needed to help more Ukrainian families is being deflected because the women in this country are being taunted and with losing their uh, reproductive rights. So I think we need to be aware and, and discuss those in very courageous and serious conversations as well. That's all, just as simple. Thank you so much. So um, we only have 23 minutes left. And since we had devoted the last half hour to questions from the audience, I'm going to see if there are questions from the audience. If not, I have a couple more questions for the panelists. So give me a moment, please, and I'll check and see what I have. Well, okay. we're waiting. Oh, go ahead. Okay. okay. I'm going to ask one of the questions, and then um, there are several there. I'm going to ask a couple of them, and then I'm going to go to one of my own questions, and then maybe we could end with that. So, uh, first question is for uh, Wanda from Anastasia, who says, Wanda, do you think the West overlooked? Russian imperialism that caused full-scale war in Ukraine? Yes, the simple answer is yes. Um, the proxy war that surely is being fought in Ukraine is escalating to an extent because it is a situation involving the relationship between China and Russia and the force of the United States coming in terms of keeping them separate in order to continue the uh, imperialism, the capitalist situation as it is. So I think it is very important to pay that. And then you have little offshoots like uh, Korea. Uh, that is trying to take advantage. The power, and I, I think it was uh, Yulia that talked about this earlier, or it may have been even Sasha, the, that after World War II, the division of who would control the nuclear weapons 
and who was allowed to have that power was essentially a decision of which both uh, Japan, many other countries were left out of even the discussions or the talks, even though they had been allies before. So this power, uh, uh, basically hierarchy that is going on, Ukraine is revealing that, but it's like, who is my ally? Who is better? And so I think for the most part, most people haven't looked at Russia the, from the Russian Revolution. They have not looked at the millions and millions of Russians killed by Stalin. And they do not understand that this is when Putin received his training and the development of his skills in order to basically surround Ukraine. And who would think if you militarily surround the country and you send your best ships in terms of into the sea, into, you are not planning a blockade, that you are not planning a serious affront to the sovereignty of that country. Only a fool would not have seen that. And the reneging on to Ukraine, that if they gave up their nuclear weapons, that the West would be there for them. This was signed off by the United States. It was signed off by the UK. And now they are slow or reluctant to give them the full force of their protection. Uh, that's a short answer. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to answer a question? Okay. Sorry, let me look at the screen. Oh, yes, I see. I guess I'll, um, yeah, yes, just, go ahead, please, Yulia. Just one sentence, and thank you, Wanda, for summing, up, summing it up so well. Indeed, there is the whole question of nuclear weapons and also who gets to vote on what is to happen in terms of who gets to invade and who gets to do what. Right In the Permanent Security Council of the United Nations, the very fact that there is a Permanent Security Council that, ca that has a right of veto to block uh, anything else from happening is something that needs to be scrapped altogether. I've been I've been holding that view for a while, but especially since this uh, latest phase of invasion. Uh, how is it that um, that a country that starts a military aggression is allowed to vote whether it can be retaliated or not? Uh, this this is absurd. This is an absolute absurd. Let alone the fact that. No, that uh, the countries who are who are holding uh, most power in the United Nations uh, used to hold military and economic uh, and otherwise control of, over most of the world uh, for centuries. This is simply not uh, on, and that that needs to be reviewed. So, you, so United Nations or whatever will follow it will need to be radically democratized in terms of decision making. And whoever is the aggressor should have their right to vote suspended, let alone have a veto uh, uh, for the duration of that aggression. But uh, that's uh, but one of the thing that I wanted to say is that um, with Russian imperialism, one of the things that get uh, that get overlooked, and this is something that I spoke about uh, in the beginning, is that the what's been going on in what used to be USSR for a lot of politicians and scholars and commentators outside of what use, was USSR and, and still within uh, within that space is a bit of a terror incognito. And Russian imperialism gets historically overlooked. Like you know, it, it didn't become the biggest country on the world map uh, by some sort of divine accident. It has become so through its expansionary policies and politics and wars uh, and through subjugating uh, what they call narodnosti, various uh, ethnic groups within the territory of Russia. If you look at who is amongst those who die in battle in Ukraine, the, uh, the higher ranks tend to be what a lot of people in the West think of as Russians. So they, they look rather, um, you know, Indo-Aryan, if you like. 
uh, and they have Russian sounding surnames. But the, uh, the average infantry, those who are thrown into the mincer of fight, they come from dilapidated, uh, neglected economically regions of Russia. Those uh, different regions and, and peoples that have been colonized historically by Russia, their, their bodies are now fighting the war in Ukraine. And that too is a socioeconomic and ethnic and racialized tragedy. Right, because they haven't seen the economic development that Moscow have seen for the last three decades. But it's them who whose families now have to have to lose their sons, brothers, uh, and and husbands. And that is that is a human tragedy because it is always the 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 lump and the proletariat who have to fight imperialistic wars, no matter where you go. And and the, and that kind of element of imperialism, because Russia and USSR have been used interchangeably in history books and still are being used interchangeably by Putin and by a lot of other commentators, because they have in, internalized that bias. Um, that kind of that, that, that blind spot, if you like, or whatever that is, that, that still gets in the way of how Russia gets seen internationally. You know, you, nobody knew what Ukraine was until 2004. This was the year I came to the UK for the first time, and people were asking me if it's the same as Russia. And then Orange Revolution happened, and people started sort of thinking about it. In 2013, 14, with Euromaidan, and then the first invasion of Russia into Ukraine, more people started realizing that those are actually separate countries, but still a lot of these kind of colonial legacies haven't moved away. And I think now there is also this kind of like fast learning curve process about uh, trying to see uh, different components of what used to be SSI and what remained within Russia as actually areas and people with their own history, with their own ethnic uh, relations, with, uh, with their own racialized dynamic, hegemonic dynamics, cultural uh, dynamics. And that is something that I hope will not last just a couple of months, but will last, uh, I mean, the learning of what what is happening in that whole region. I hope this is something that, that continues. Like, you know, the people who live within that vast space need to be seen for who they are and not just, you know, some sort of mass uh, under Moscow. Thank you. So uh, let me see if I can summarize the other question and then quickly go to one more question from myself. Um, okay, so I'm just going to limit myself to one more question from the audience. And that is from Evangelos, uh, who says, do you think that mothers can change the root of world history after taking initiative against the conscription of their sons in a worldwide movement. Let's see who would like to answer that question? Uh, Sasha? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, um, I Yeah, as for roles of mothers in uh, anti-war resistance and uh, its history and its legacy in contemporary Russia, uh, for us as feminist anti-war resistance is really important to cooperate with Soldiers Mothers Committee, these women's organizations that were established during the late Soviet years and were actually very active during Chechen wars. They were able to come even to battlefield and take away, took away their sons from the battlefield. Uh, even uh, sometimes when they are captured or even just uh, also takes them from uh, um, military station wherever they were located. And uh, we do think that, but it's not, uh, I would, yes, I would prevent anyone from thinking in essentialist categories about mothers. It's not and uh, more in categories of labor and uh, social reproductive labor that they contributed to raising their kids. And mothers know how expensive, how difficult it is to give birth and to raise a human being, right? And they are the ones who can actually value, who can see this labor. And that's what I think that that is so um, powerful in the image of mothers, right? Um, and that's why we're also yeah, seeking cooperation and 
<laughs> with this uh, type of organizations in Russia. And I would just say that now we have a number of these uh, soldiers' mothers' committees uh, that helping uh, conscripts to not to go to the army. And if people are already conscripted, not to go to Ukraine and support their, um, um, so to say, right uh, uh, not to go there. Uh, but also there are new mothers' organizations that appeared during this new wave of war in Russia, which I getting more and more um, powerful, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Anyone else wants to comment on that? Okay, so um, I had two other questions, one which considered uh, uh, concerned um, the issue of uh, gender violence on a global scale and how we can draw connections to um, the systematic and often government-sponsored violence against women around the globe in Xinjiang, province of China, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, Sudan, Ethiopia, and elsewhere. And, uh, and there's a, st a struggle for abortion rights in, in or for reproductive rights in the US. Um, and uh, specifically, how to draw connections to the Me Too movement uh, which was founded by an African-American woman in the U.S., Tarana Burke. That was one question. And the other was about um, the issue of uh, Putin and the Russian state being promoters of white supremacy and ethno-nationalism and their strong ties to, as Wanda also mentioned earlier, their strong ties to uh, Donald Trump, Marine Le Pen, Jair Bolsonaro, Narendra Modi, and... Um, and also the question of, you know, the criticism that has been raised about some right-wing forces inside Ukraine, uh, although they, they are a lot smaller in comparison to the size of Ukraine than the Russian state is in terms of its fascist uh, both ideology and uh, active, active promotion of funding of organizations, of Nazi organizations. So I, I, that was the other question about how to draw connections to... Um, global anti-racist struggles, especially the Global South and Black Lives Matter. And specifically, for instance, a uh, very important case is that we have an African-American woman um, inside a Russian prison right now, Brittany Greiner, who's a, a L L LGBT basketball player, uh, has been in prison in Russia since February, and so little has been said about her. I don't mean this panel, I mean, in general, in the US, um, you hardly hear about her. Just recently, this past week, I think some media are talking more about her case. And this is a very important way, I think, of both demanding, you know, tr trying to publicize her case, demand her release, but also draw connections to uh, struggles uh, uh, against racism in the U.S. and LGBTQ struggles. And then more in general, um, connections to the Syrian struggle, which you know, experienced, uh, has experienced um, uh, massive Russian bombings and Russia is still there very much in force defending the Assad regime and uh, um, connecting to the Palestinian struggle, which is also a struggle for self-determination. And uh, so I, I just put all of that out there in case any of you want to respond to it and, uh, and then we'll end after, after your comments. Sasha, go ahead. Oh, you, sorry, I, I'm still lost with Skype. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. So I might add really brief uh, comment to as an answer to these questions. And uh, I would like to actually emphasize one more time this important fact that there is a lot of discussion about right wing in Ukraine now. And uh, in these discussions, for some reason, people do not mention the degree of support of alt-right wing in Russia from the state and from the police. And we as feminist activists, we constantly face with uh, these attacks of right-wing telegram channels and communities that are backed by the police. And there were um, uh, investigations that established that police leaked 
they um, documents of activists to these right wing groups so that they would be harassed uh, so that activists would be harassed and threatened and of course russian police would never ever under any circumstances protect us from these right wing guys and uh, it's also important that uh, in contemporary russia this uh, there is an extensive usage of the ussr heritage and symbols which maybe leave some people in the west kind of disillusioned about what is going on in Russia and also uh, legally, right? Russia inherited Soviet Union in the sense in many of its legal and um, I don't know, debt and etc. And that confuses people, whereas in contemporary Russia, red um, official Russian red flag means nothing more than brown. There is no connection with any type of socialist agenda or any type of, yeah, um, I don't know, worker struggle uh, with Russian state, which is turning into full kind of post-fascist state because there is luckily not that huge grassroots mobilization. But what we can observe for sure that uh, anti-war or, I don't know, left-wing, uh, anarchist, uh, even liberal grassroots organizations would be harassed and threatened by the state and police, whereas for right-wing organizations in Russia, they have way more freedom that we are, uh, that we do. And I would also want to balance this uh, discussion about right-wing um, forces in Ukraine with the fact that, don't forget that from on the Russian side, there is also lots of right wing explicitly. Ah, and the, the last remark, right? We all know that Russian state media officially uh, um, promoted uh, rhetorics of cleansing of Ukrainian people. And when this explicitly uh, Nazist rhetorics is promoted by the state media, we cannot turn our blind eye on it, right? And keep talking about um, only Ukrainian problems, right? Uh, so it's definitely our um, shared struggle. And please don't <laughs> exclude Russian fascists from uh, this um, struggle as well. But, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So we have uh, Yulia and Wanda. Thank you. Um, and thank you. Thank you for the great question. And thank you, Sasha, for uh, such a good answer. I guess this the question about Ukrainian nationalists is becoming a little, uh, a little uh, mossy old. Uh, so thank you for answering that. So I don't have to. What I would rather want to talk to you in this question about the about women violence and uh, how to um, prevent it, if you like, I, I like to draw from uh, materialist feminist on this. And I like to think about predeterminants of violence, like why do people become violent with each other? Um, and I also know that uh, the neoliberal strands of feminism will not, neoliberalized rather strands of feminism do not have the answer to that. Because what we need is we need more care, socioeconomic elevation, not, not instead of uh, more militarism and lean-in feminism, where women have to, have to do not two, but three, four, five shifts and also serve in the military and go to the nail salon and be of a certain weight and look a certain way and make sure that you know, they remain permanently looking 18 years old. That uh, those uh, that kind of the ideological frame that that pushes society to see women through that lens. And now it's it's moving on to men with their barber shops and and manicures. It's you know because that's a new space through which accumulation of capital can continue by breeding insecurities and certain uh, idiotic stereotypes pushing them on 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 people. So. What I want to see as like, you know, what I think we need to be thinking about is how to eliminate the predeterminants in our societies for, um, uh, for forms of violence taking root. So what we have seen in, in Ukraine and across the globe, indeed, is the erosion of uh, and defunding of the foundational economy sectors in our economies and where there have been certain wins 
uh, after the Second World War, mainly in advanced capitalist economies, those are being rolled back again in terms of healthcare, education, uh, funded uh, subsidized transport, and so on and so forth. So what we should be what we should be fighting for in Ukraine, and also kind of like take take from that experience as well, is we should be campaigning for the large scale macroeconomic restructuring and rebuilding program, so that people's homes and communities can be rebuilt, because everybody needs a home and every community uh, and a community, and they need institutional and economic means of support to build the life that they want, raise their children or not have children, have their and be with their loved ones and have themselves and their loved ones looked after at any age, regardless of medical needs. And that applies to every country. And that's a family struggle uh, that is international and transnational. We need to campaign governments for inter and international institutions, in, in the case of Ukraine, to support it, not least through cancellation of debt, because Ukraine is one of the most indebted countries in the world. And that, again, talks to a lot of other countries who, ha who have gone through the process of decolonization on paper, but not economically. We need to have removal of austerity demands from IMF and EU in the case, or in the case of Ukraine, where socioeconomic security needs to be centered. It needs to be provided to everyone. Fully funded public services and socialized care they are foundations without which patriarchal capitalism cannot be challenged and women nor men cannot be free. And there also needs to be campaigning for the European Green Deal principles or uh, you know, generally kind of just green transition principles being enshrined uh, in any next economic transformation, especially around care economy, to be enshrined in reconstruction planning. Those are fundamental for the from the previous point that I've just made, and they can also be economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable economy in Ukraine and in other countries that would be green and low carbon and that will improve our communities, will teach us, will not get us fighting for resources and hating each other, but will meet our basic needs and will eliminate the need for conflict to be begin with. It will reduce our energy dependency on fossil fuels, will decrease your political vulnerabilities and help attain true sovereignty, energy and otherwise, and thus build a more stable and hopefully less war-prone future. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Wanda. I had to step away because the gardener was having full force on the uh, bushes next door. Uh, so I wanted to apologize for the minute. I, I will catch up in terms of just a few things. Yula, that, Yulia, that was just fantastic. The Brittany Griner question first, just very quickly. It, she was arrested in January. And it was not revealed that she was actually imprisoned until after the invasion of Ukraine. And people think that was inadvertent or it was accidental. It was not. It is an issue on LGBT in terms of it because she had been going there for years. She would not need to take drugs into Russia. Any drugs she needs, she could get in Russia. Okay, so they want us to believe that she would actually be taking drugs there is uh, mind boggling, but it's crazy. We in the United States, many people do not understand. We are fighting January 6th every day. Our democracy suffered a coup that only this amount of people prevented the coup of the United States. Now, in Ukraine, I don't expect that the mothers that are giving their lives would understand that democracy in the United States is under such a great threat. It is. And that right, the extreme right that Sasha brought up, is about to control in November the possibility of our election process and there has not been any response of any magnitude from the Biden administration. We are in trouble. And I, when I say that um, Ukraine is that bellwether, that canary, they may be a stronger democracy than the United States after November. That is scary to imagine, but I think it's important. Now on the gender question of women, Yes, it has to be a solidarity because we basically, there is a, a model of the ancient palace and city state 
where women were proud to send their sons to battle. And if he didn't go to battle, if, if he died in battle, that was their honor. That no longer can be. We cannot continue to do that. We cannot continue to send the best of us to war. We cannot continue. That is part of the process. We are being forced to have children for them to be fodder in wars. And in the United States, because the devaluation of black women, we have had to learn to use guns. We would never even think about, in many situations, not being able to shoot because it was necessary to, for the protection of the family. And the women were often sent to be in confrontation sometimes to buy supplies or at the store or ask for an extension of poverty for to get some flour or what they needed in the South. So you must understand that when we talk about reframing and looking at the issues that the gender definition says, this is what we are supposed to be superfluous or a trophy wife or a, a symbol of this. You have to understand that the United States put two pedophiles on the Supreme Court of the United States. So the law of the land is being usurped. So I could go on that forever. I will take any, uh, even off uh, our time, to say what they, the state told us to be silent about Brittany Griner. To be silent, that would help her case. That's why even though we have the professional uh, basketball tournaments, everybody is watching, nobody's saying anything. Okay, and so that ha cannot be, but at the same time, I have to know more about the system of imprisonment in Russia in order to make a, a, a constructive plan in order to help someone who is in that position. Okay, and thank you for, for, for all of you, it's fantastic. Great. Thank you so thank much, you much. Really appreciate your comments, everyone's responses, and uh, let's just wrap it up. Um, so, uh, those who want to be involved in uh, global feminist solidarity along the lines that we discussed today are welcome to contact me at ffari second at yahoo.com. That's F as in Frank. Afari, my full last name, and second, ffari second at yahoo.com. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank Sean Larson, our engineer from Haymarket Books, uh, Danny Pastel and Lala Penuranda, and uh, Stephen Shalom from Internationalism from Below, and uh, all of our speakers and the audience. And looking forward to hearing from you because this is just the beginning of the work. And we really don't want to leave this at a panel. We want to follow through on what we discussed and talk about some actions, activities, practical work. And I look forward to hearing from everyone about that. And uh, thank you so much for your participation. Goodbye.